In this video, we're going to take a look at comparing two samples where we have a population mean where sigma is unknown and the variances are unequal. So again, we're going to take a look at what the conditions are. And you'll see that many of the conditions are the same. The samples have to be random and independent, just as before. And the population standard deviations have to be unknown. So this one's different than the last time, of course, because on the last one we were dealing with known population standard deviations. Um, this one is the same as last time when we had two population means where sigma was known. Either both sample sizes are greater than or equal to 30, or both population distributions are nearly normal. And then this one is key in this particular situation because we're going to have sometimes where we have unequal variances and sometimes where we have equal variances. So in this case, the population variances are assumed to be unequal or we are told that they are unequal. And what that means is when we find the variance, which is the standard deviation, which is part of our standard error, we're not going to use a pooled variance. So it just means that you're going to have a different calculation for that particular part. So again, general process is the same. Because um, the standard deviation is unknown, of course, we're using a T model. We still have means, so our point estimate is still X bar one minus X bar two. Um, but now we're using that T star, and then when you have unequal variances, the number of degrees of freedom is the smaller of N1 minus one and N2 minus one. So this is key here, because if you have the wrong degrees of freedom, then your whole interval is wrong. I want you to notice that this part looks the same as what we did before when we knew sigma, um, except obviously that these are S's now, and they're S's because we don't know sigma, we know the sample standard deviation. But really, those are the key differences. So let's take a look at a question together. So someone is unhappy with, Misty is unhappy with the class she is taking, and she believes that the difficulty in class, of course, has to do with the inexperienced teacher. She believes that students in her class are receiving lower scores on their exams than students in another class with a more experienced teacher. She collects exam scores from a random sample of 11 of her classmates. So let's just label that as N1. That's the number of um, observations. Calculates a mean score. So X bar one is 75 with a standard deviation. Now again, that's not sigma, that's S1 because it's of the sample of eight. She then collects a random sample of nine students from another class, so that's N2, and calculates that the mean exam score is 82, so X bar two is 82, with a standard deviation of five, so S2 is five. We are going to assume that the population distributions of exam scores are approximately, approximately normal for both, um, of course, that's helping us check our conditions. We are going to construct a 90% confidence interval for the true difference between the mean exam scores for the two classes. And then, of course, the question, does this interval suggest that the inexperienced teacher's class is receiving lower scores? So let's just start working on it. So I've recopied all of the pertinent information from our last slide. We have a 90% interval. I have all of Misty's class and all of the other class um, right up here at the top. Step one, find the point estimate, which is to subtract the two sample means. So 75 minus 82 is negative seven. All that tells us is that the mean difference in scores, so this isn't an estimate, that's, that's the exact point estimate or center of our interval is negative seven. So overall, Misty's class is scoring lower on average than the other class. Step two, we have to find our critical value. And you can sort of roll all of that into one step with find your you know, margin of error. But I wanted to break it into its own step so that we could remember all of the parts involved in finding a critical value. For a T model, which is what happens when sigma is unknown, we have to find the degrees of freedom. Particularly when we have unequal variances, the number of degrees of freedom is the smaller of N1 minus one and N2 minus one. So that's 
11 minus 1, which is 10, and 9 minus 1, which is 8, and the smaller of those is 8. So I'm going to use 8 degrees of freedom, and I have a 90% interval, so just as before, we've got 90 here in the middle. That means there's 5% here, and there's 5% here. So I used T inverse 0.95, because that's how much area is to the left of this value, and then comma 8, 8 being the degrees of freedom. So that's our critical value of 1.860. Step three, we're to find the margin of error. So we're going to use the 1.860 that we just found, and we're going to use the standard deviation and square it divided by the sample size, and the standard deviation and square it divided by the sample size, and again, let your calculator or Excel do all of that calculation for you. Don't find parts and then round parts and then use rounded parts to create new parts. You should end up with this value for your margin of error. Step four, find your interval, write it mathematically. So it's kind of up to you. Um, sometimes you'll see me show lower, uh, lower limit and then you'll see negative seven minus 5.45 blah 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 and then upper limit and you'll find you'll see me do it on two separate steps and it's totally fine to do it that way and it's also totally fine to do it this way as long as you recall at the end you're going to want interval notation which is in this case negative 12.5 to negative 1.5 so big question then what does that mean so when we interpret the interval, remember there are two parts. We just talked about this. The first part is we just talk about what this means in context. We're 90% confident that the mean exam score for students in the inexperienced teacher's class is between 1.5 and 12.5 points lower, again, because of the negative, than the mean exam score for students in the experienced teacher's class. The other part of our interpretation should always be talking about zero. Now, if you think about a number line, negative 12.5 is here, negative 1.5 is here, zero is here. So here's my interval, here's zero not in my interval. So since zero falls above the interval, that's greater than the interval, we can conclude that the experienced teacher's class performed better than the inexperienced teacher's class. Again, because zero is not in the interval. Now, I did include this little fun fact down here just because uh, I think it's always important to remember that the only way that you can show cause and effect is with an experiment, and this is not an experiment. This was just uh, an observation. So I can't say that the reason that the experienced teacher's class performed better is because of better teaching. I can just say that there's evidence that those students are performing better than the students in Misty's class. I now want to take a look at Excel and on the left side of your screen we're going to look at that question that we just looked at. So if you'll notice I've already entered the first mean, the first standard deviation, the first sample size, the second mean, the second standard deviation, the second sample size, and the confidence level of 90%. So we're going to talk about how to find um, the degrees of freedom, the point estimate, etc. Now, the first thing you'll want to do is the degrees of freedom. Now, it's completely up to you. If you want to simply do this part yourself and enter in degrees of freedom, you can. Remember, it would be looking at 11 minus 1 or 9 minus 1. The other way you can do this, and this is the way that I do it, is using an if statement. So if, and then what I do is I take a look at a logical test. So if n1 is less than n2, then my value, so if this guy is smaller, then I want this minus 1. And if it's not true, then I want this one, minus one. So notice my degrees of freedom is eight. Now that's what we had found before, because what Excel did is said, well, 11 
is actually bigger than 9, so we're going to take that smaller one, 9, and subtract 1. So that's how I find the degrees of freedom without having to do any work. The point estimate, as we know, is simply the difference of the means. So mean 1 minus mean 2. The standard error of the differences is using the formula. So I'm going to take the square root. Oops, probably an equal sign would be good there the square root, and then I'm going to take the first standard deviation and square it and divide it by the first sample size. And then I'm going to add to that the second standard deviation and square it and divide it by the second sample size. So I'm just using the formula, this formula right here. The critical value, that's the t alpha over 2. Remember, it's actually a little bit easier when you're using the t values because I don't have to use um, 0.9 and then 1 minus 0.9 divided by 2. I can actually use t dot inverse 2 tail. And then the probability is just, I think I have to use 1 minus 0.9. I might be wrong on this. I usually do it the other way. And then the degrees of freedom, whoops, degrees of freedom is whatever value this is. Um, and so hopefully that's what we had found by hand, and it was. So again, I took 1 minus, so really it's the alpha level that I need right here. 1 minus B7, so um, 0.9 is my critical level. You need your alpha level. And then the margin of error is multiplying those two values. Whoops. And then, of course, lower limit, upper limit, point estimate um, minus the margin of error, point estimate plus the margin of error. And if you'll notice, we have everything um, correct the way that we had found it by hand. Now, the other thing um, that you might have is a question like the one on your screen now. So the one on your screen is different in that we are not given the mean, we are not given the standard deviation or the sample size of either. So what I want to do is show you how to do that. So I've set these cells up exactly the same way um, as I just went through with you. But notice there's no mean, there's no standard deviation. I have copied the two columns of data. So 12, 9, 14, etc. I've copied all of that. So really all we have to do is use what we know about Excel to find the mean. So I'm going to do average, and I want the average of this column. And then I want the standard deviation. Now this is a sample. So stdev.s. And again, of my first column. And then equals count of that first column of data. And then I'm going to do the exact same thing for my second set of data. So equals average of e and equals standard deviation of the sample of E and equals count of E. And then in this case, the confidence level asks for a 95% confidence level. And again, everything is then calculated for me. I have the point estimate as 0 0.0636, etc., the margin of error. And in this case, we have um, a difference that includes zero. So we are 95% confident that the difference between the two population means is between 2.34 less and 2.47 more. But again, there's no context here. So we really can't say, oh, you know, this means that these are the same or different. Obviously, zero is contained in the interval. Um, so we can't say there's a difference between the two samples, but we don't know what the samples are. So context would be everything here. Coming up next, we're going to look at the exact same type of question, except in this case, we're going to have equal variances.